Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am under some art. This week, we are finally starting to talk about file systems. I feel like I keep talking and talking and talking about file systems and thinking about how cool they are, and now we finally actually get to start talking about them. So I'm really looking forward to, to being able to talk about this. The first chapter for this week that I've asked you to read is a pretty high level overview of the interface that a file system ultimately implements. It gives you this taste of a file system in that it starts to describe things like what an inode is, and it spends a lot of time going into a lot more detail about the POSIX API or something that looks like the POSIX API. So the system calls that you would have to make and that are ultimately implemented by a file system. The file system that's described in chapter 40, which is what we're going to be looking at, is called VSFS. And VSFS is a file system that looks a lot like ext2 in the Linux kernel. We'll spend a little bit of time in class talking about the different kinds of file systems that there are, but Bobcat smells like french fries. We'll spend a little bit of time in class talking about more file systems and how they're different from each other and how they can evaluate each other or how we can evaluate them. But in this chapter, we're really just taking a look at the implementation of a file system. So the start of this chapter is introducing us to how we might think about a file system. And the way that the authors are recommending that we think about file systems is maybe a little bit different than we've thought about the way that things are on a program and the way that things are as a file. The suggestion that the authors have for us in terms of thinking about the way that a file system works or the way that we should think about file systems is that there are two parts to it. The first part of a file system is going to be the data structures that are used by the file system to physically lay out data on a disk. So if we were to take a disk and actually use, you know, like a magnetic head to read things off of it, how would we organize the data structures physically on that disk? The other thing that they suggest that we think about is how to map those ideas into the API that we've taken a look at. So given the data structures that we have, how do we map those data structures onto the API? And how do we treat the data structures when those system calls are made? So what do we have to read when we call open? What do we have to read when we call read? What do we have to change when we call read about the data structures that we have on disk? What parts of things need to be updated when we call write? So yes, they're, they're tied together. These two ideas are tied together but it does make sense to think about them separately from each other. One is just how data is physically organized on the disk, and the other is how that physical organization maps to an API that is defined by something like POSIX. We're gonna start by taking a look at the overall organization. So we're gonna take a high level look at what is effectively a blank disk, and we're going to start mapping parts of this file system, VSFS, onto that blank disk. And as we go through this procedure, we're going to be looking at how the data structures look on this disk. So the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at this little diagram here that's got a bunch of blocks on it. This is at a super high level how most file systems organize information on a disk. What we've done with this diagram is effectively divided our disk into blocks. A block is a contiguous sequence of bytes. This looks like an array. This diagram that we have here looks like an array because it's a really good way to think about how a disk is organized logically from the perspective of a file system and from our perspective. Each block in this diagram has a block size. The block size here tells us how many bytes are in each of these logical blocks of information. So how many bytes are, do each of these chunks take up? This is similar to 
but incredibly frustratingly not exactly the same as this idea that we looked at previously with hard drives of sectors. Sectors and blocks, they're similar in concept. We're logically organizing parts of a disk into contiguous things, but sectors and blocks, they are distinct. They are different from each other. This diagram has 64 total blocks. And for what we're thinking about, each of these blocks has four kilobytes of block size. So there's four 4096 bytes in each one of these blocks. This is step one. In and of itself, <laughs> this is not super helpful. All we've really done is made the physical or the logical organization of a disk more complicated in that we now have both sectors to think about and blocks to think about. We've separated our disk into blocks, but now what we're going to do is start to think about where we're gonna put the actual data that we want to store in this file system. Let's take a look at the next figure here. And the next figure here is basically us saying blocks eight through 63 are going to be where we put data. We haven't done anything yet. We haven't written any programs. We haven't written any structures to overlay onto this disk. All we've said is that blocks eight through 63 in this sequence of blocks that we've divided our disk into, they are going to be the place where we actually put the data for files. So the bytes that you have in your text files, the bytes that you have in your C source code, the bytes that you have in your ELF files, the bytes that you have in videos, the bytes that you have in images. These are all going to be stored in this long region of data. The other thing that we need to think about here is we need to think about where to put data about the data. So this is called metadata. We can say, I'm going to put all of this data in this region, but we need to be able to get the data back out after we have put it there. So when we do a read system call, when we do an open and a read, for example, we'd need to be able to actually get the data out of this data region. We're going to store information about the data, metadata, and the data in two separate places. Let's look at the next diagram here. The metadata that we're going to store is going to be using this structure called an inode. We're going to allocate five blocks of this entire disk for the purpose of storing inodes. The inodes that we have are going to keep extra information like, you know, what's the name of this file? And who owns this file? And when was it created? And how big is this file? How many bytes does this file have? This diagram shows that we have five blocks with inodes in them. To be clear, this doesn't mean that we only have five inodes. That, that, if we had only five inodes, we'd actually only have five files. Instead, each of these five blocks has many inodes in it. We're gonna say that for the purposes of this file system, VSFS, each inode takes 256 bytes. So that means that we can actually put 16 inodes in each of these blocks. If we have eight, five blocks, if we have five blocks and we have 16 inodes per block, that means that with this disk, with this file system, we can have 80 files. That's amazing. We can put 80 files on this disk. We've now separated our blocks into the place where we're going to put data and we've separated it into a place where we're going to store metadata, data about the data that we actually keep in this file system. The rem one of the remaining problems that we have is that given just the inodes and just the data region, and especially the data region, there's no way for us to know which inodes are used, which data regions are used, which data blocks are actually used. So we need to keep some allocation structures. An allocation structure is going to be information that we have about the state of blocks in the disk. These allocation structures are going to tell us whether or not an inode has been used and whether or not a data block has been used. So we're gonna add two more blocks here, an inode bitmap and a data bitmap. These are going to occupy two blocks, one block for inode bitmap and one block for data bitmap. For complete clarity, 
this idea of a bitmap isn't really, you know, the kind of thing that you make in Microsoft Paint. I mean, it is, yeah, sure it is, but a bitmap in the context of what we're thinking about with file systems is a sequence of literally just ones and zeros, so bits. We're talking about bits here, and the bits are going to map onto other things. They're going to tell us about other things. So let's take a look at this little diagram, and this is one that I've drawn. This is not actually in the book. The inode bitmap, so this is the one that is on the leftmost side. The inode bitmap is going to be a sequence of ones and zeros, and each index of a bit is going to say that an inode in the inode table, which is that region, those five blocks that we have filled with inodes, each bit in this is going to tell us whether that index inode has been populated or not. So in this little diagram here, we've got bit zero, and bit zero has a value of zero. That means that inode zero has not been used. In bit one, two, and three, we have values of one. That means that inodes one, two, and three have been populated. So there are files with those inode numbers. Bit four has a value of zero. That means inode four has, a, has not been used. Bit five has a value of one. So that means that inode number five has been used. Similarly, this data bitmap corresponds to blocks in the data region. Where the inode bitmap is corresponding to these tiny inodes, these 256 byte inodes within the inode table, the data bitmap is corresponding to entire blocks in the data region. One block corresponds directly to one file. So one file might have many blocks, but it can't, you can't have more than one file's data inside of one data block. This data bitmap then is saying, Position zero in the data bitmap is zero, so that means that data block zero has not been used by any files. Position one here has a value of one, so data block one has been populated by some file. We don't know which one, we just know that it has been used. Okay, so this is really great. Now we've got a place to put our data, we have a place to put data about our data, and we have a place to tell us whether or not those metadata fields have been used and whether or not blocks in the data region have been used. The last piece of information that we need to keep about a file system is going to be stored in this last remaining block that we haven't marked off or anything yet. The thing that we're going to put into this block is something called the super block. The super block is going to have information about the file system itself. So this is the data that's going to tell the mounting program how it should interpret the file system. It's going to have information about the entire file system itself. So how many inodes have been used? How many inodes are there in, this, in total in this file system? How many data blocks are there in total in this file system? What's the block size in this file system? All of these are parameters that can be used by that file system, and all of this information is going to be stored in the super block. When you actually go through this process of mounting a file system into your directory tree, the program that does the mounting is going to actually inspect this super block to figure out what information it needs to know about this file system that you're trying to mount. All right, so that's really good. We've now got our entire set of blocks set aside for something. We still haven't written any programs. We still have not written any structs to represent anything on this file system. All we've done is kind of come up with a bunch of magic numbers. And these magic numbers are going to be this range of the, file, of the blocks in the file system are used for this purpose. This range of the blocks in the file system are used for this purpose. So data, and then inodes, and then bitmaps, and then super block. That's all that we've done so far. The most important part of this file system, and honestly a, a lot of like Unix and Linux file systems, is something called the inode. As I said earlier, you're kind of given a taste of what this inode is in the last chapter, and in this chapter we're going to take a little bit more of a detailed look at this. The first property that we want to think about in terms of inodes is this inode number. In the last chapter you're kind of told, inodes have a number, full stop. You can kind of think of that as a unique identifier for these 
files that is distinct from the file name. The inode number here, if we kind of think about this file system, let's take a look at another little diagram here, taking a closer look at the inode table. The inode number is, is quite literally just the index of the inode in the inode table. So the inode that has number 17 for a number is very literally index number 17 in the inode table. If we have these inode structs and they're all mapped sequentially and contiguously in this inode table region. When we actually write software to try to find these inodes on the file system, we have to be able to find these inodes on a disk. We again have this really infuriating two concepts now for how to separate a disk logically into chunks. We've got blocks and we've got sectors. We need to figure out how to map these blocks onto sectors so that we can actually get the inodes out of the file system and out of the disk. When we write this code, we're actually gonna have to make some assumptions. And this is where all this magic number stuff comes in. We're dividing this, this disk up logically and we're saying this region is going to be for this purpose. We're going to use these magic numbers and I'm gonna now refer to them as well-known locations as places to start from in the disk. The inode table itself in this file system is a well-known location. We know how big blocks are and we can map those blocks onto sectors. The inode table itself, we know as a well-known location, begins at 12 kilobytes into this disk. If we're working with blocks, that means that we can basically say that if we're looking for inode number 32, we can kind of just say 32 times size of whatever an inode is and then add that to 12 kilobytes and we should be positioned in this table, positioned in this file, positioned in this disk, at the place for that specific inode. Translating this from blocks into sectors now is going to have a bit of a formula attached to it, and this is the formula right here. So to figure out which block an inode is in, we have to figure out where in the block, where in the inode table that that inode is, so which block it's in, and we can use this first half of the formula to figure that out. So I number times size of inode T divided by block size. That tells us which block the inode is in. Then we can translate that into a sector in the second half of this. So block times block size plus inode start address. That's the start of the inode table itself. And then divide that all by sector size. So this is going from whatever block size and it's translating it to the corresponding sector that's on the disk that would have this. Remember that disks themselves are not byte addressable. We can't access that inode directly. Instead, we have to access the sector which contains that byte the sector which contains that inode and then get the inode out of that sector later. That's, that's, that's getting the inodes out of the disk itself. Let's spend a little bit more time talking about inodes themselves. What does an inode actually look like and what is an inode? What even is an inode? An inode is metadata for a single file or a single directory and the inode itself has metadata about that file or that directory. So remember, metadata is data about data. Here is an example of what an inode looks like. This is what the authors refer to as a simplified ext2 inode in figure 40.1. There's a lot of stuff in this. So there's things like the mode of this file, can this file be read, written, and executed? You might see me sometimes using the ls command when I'm uh, navigating through the file system on the terminal, and you might see this block of rwx at the beginning of the entries for files. This is that mode. This is that octal mode that says the permissions of the file. There's a user ID that says it's owned by this person or this user account. It's got a size. It has some information about access and modification times. The really important part here is this section closer to the bottom. There's size 60 and there's this thing called block. This is a set of disk pointers and then it says 15 in total. These are called direct pointers into the file system. So I've got a diagram here that I've prepared. The inode that we have here is on the left, and I've kind of copied some of the attributes to, to show you that this is the same structure that we're looking at just uh, before here. 
The iNote itself has a mode, a UID, a size, some other stuff, and then it's got this block attribute. The block attribute itself is going to be something that looks like an array. The array is going to have addresses into the disk about which blocks have the data for this file. So in this example, this is a bad example in that these numbers are not contiguous, but it's an example to give you the idea of what this looks like. Block zero of this file corresponds to block 16 in the file system, in the data region. Block one of this file is block 12 in the data region. Block two of this file is 18 in the data region. Block three of this file is block 26 in the data region. These are direct pointers. That means that byte zero of the file that's represented by this inode begins in block 16 of the data region. You might notice that this is kind of limiting. If we have this block that has size 60 and it's limited to 15 pointers, that kind of means that we can have only 15 blocks worth of data in a file. 15 blocks with 4K blocks is what, 60 kilobytes? It's not a very big file. It's not really a very big file, especially when we think about, you know, pictures and like, movies and stuff. This isn't really gonna scale very well. The solution to this problem is to use something called indirect pointers and multi-level indexes. The basic idea of multi-level indexes and indirect pointers is, is kind of the same as what a block pointer is in this sense, but the difference here is that an indirect pointer will point at a block that has more pointers in it. So let's take a look at another diagram here that I've drawn. We still got the same inode structure. It still got things like UID and size. It has a block array, but we're going to assume that those 12 blocks have been populated. The set of indirect blocks then are going to be a set of pointers to the disk where the blocks that are referred to by this set of pointers themselves contain more block pointers. So the first indirect block pointer here is block number, uh, number zero in the indirect pointer section, and it refers to block number eight in the data region. What this then says is that block number eight in the data region itself is filled with block pointers. So four kilobytes worth of block pointers. The first block pointer that's in number eight points to number 11, then 12, and then 13. So that means that indirectly, Blocks 11, 12, and 13 belong to this inode. Triply indirect, doubly indirect, and triply indirect pointers basically follow the same pattern, except it's going to be a pointer to a pointer full of blocks, and a pointer to a pointer to a pointer full of blocks. This is an unbalanced tree structure, and it, it looks kind of weird to begin with, but the, the purpose of it and the reason that it's organized this way is justified by this idea that most files on a file system are small. Here's figure 40.2. This is showing average file sizes for files that are found, it's files that are found on a file system. This comes from a study, and the study was done like 14 years ago, so I imagine that these properties have changed a little bit but I still think that the general case here is true. Most files are very small. The average size of files might be bigger, and there are very few very big files that were, you would need to actually get to this point of triply and direct pointers. Let's now start thinking about directory organization. I've mentioned a couple times that inodes refer to exactly one file or one directory. Let's start trying to think about how directories actually look. Files themselves, I think, are fairly straightforward. You've got inodes, they've got block pointers. The block pointers that are referred to are the actual data of the file. Directories, though, are kind of different. When we look at directories, they look different from files. When we see a directory in a file system, it looks different from a file in that a directory contains files or other directories. In terms of the data structure that we're using, though, a directory itself is actually just represented as an inode itself. The inode structure will have some property on it that says what kind of inode it is. Is it a file or is it a directory? If it's a directory inode, 
then the file system driver, the software that reads this file system and uses this file system, is going to interpret that inode's data as a directory. So if it's marked as a directory, the blocks are going to be interpreted as directory entries. Here's an example of what that might look like. So the directory that would be referred to by this inode, so we've got an inode in our inode table, it has a direct pointer to some data block, and that data block itself then has these entries in it. So it's a table of names and properties about these files that are within this. The first column here is showing the inode numbers. So the data in this data block will have the inode numbers that, the that are the files that are in this directory. It has something called a record length, which is used to help you figure out how many bytes are in the name of the file in this directory, especially when things are deleted from this directory, when you unlink something from this directory. And then we've got this string length that tells us how long the name of the file is. This is kind of an interesting property about directories. We think of files as themselves having names, but in reality, in practice, this is reversed a little bit. A file is only named by the directory that it's contained in. The directory that has files in it is what has the names for those files. That actually means that we might have the same file inside of multiple directories, and each time it will have a different name. It's kind of an interesting property, and that's kind of cool. So now we've separated our disk logically. We've got a data region, we've got a metadata region, We've got allocation bitmaps, allocation structures, and we've got a super block, information about the file system itself. We've got inodes. We're able to find inodes in sectors, which are able to translate their block location into a sector. And we're now able to think about what an inode is, both as a file and as a directory. And we're able to get the data back out of the file system based on what's in the inode structure itself. This is assuming now that we've populated a file system and we've never deleted anything from it. Let's spend a little bit of a little bit of more time talking about these allocation structures from the perspective of free space management. We've effectively got a way to represent whether an inode is used or not and whether a data block is used or not. These allocation structures are going to be used to help your file system optimize itself. So now think about this for a second. You add files to the file system, they're going to be put into probably contiguous blocks, contiguous inodes, so numbered, um, inode numbers that are right next to each other, inode 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, are the first six files in this file system. Those inodes are going to point at data region blocks that are contiguous. Inode number 0 points to the first four blocks, inode number 2 points to the next four blocks, and so on. The thing with file systems, though, is that we don't just add stuff to the file system. We also delete stuff from a file system. Ultimately, what this is going to do is our file system driver is going to use these allocation structures, these bitmaps, and it's going to set and unset bits, turn them on, turn them off, flip them to one, change them back to zero. It's going to use this information to help it know where free space is, but it can also use this information to help to optimize itself. You may or may not have ever heard of this idea of defragmenting your hard drive. A fragmented hard drive is going to be a bunch of files on a hard drive that are just scattered across many different blocks with many different gaps in between them. So you'll have this file that has direct pointers, but the pointers themselves are not going to refer to blocks that are immediately next to each other. Here is a little image of the Windows 95 defragmenting software. And it's, it's doing kind of literally what it's showing. It's taking blocks from this hard drive and it's shifting them around. And it's updating the structures in, the, in what is the same idea as an inode in the file system that's used in Windows 95. That, that's pretty much the whole file system. We didn't really talk a lot about the super block, but we'll spend a little bit of time taking a look at a super block in class this week. Let's now talk about the other half of what this is supposed to be. We've got this structure on disk. How do we map that structure on disk into the, into the system calls that are going to be used by user software? How do we take inodes and map them to the open system call? How do we take inodes and their pointers 
and map those to the read system call or the write system call. Let's take a look at figure 40.3 first. This is an example of reading a file. The specific file that this is reading is called foo bar, so slash foo slash bar, and we're opening it with a read-only attribute. Our intent with this file upon opening it and reading it is to open it and never write to it. We don't want to write to it. Let's start at the top of this figure and we're going to work our way down. And what this is showing us is which sections of the disk are going to be consulted and changed as we do this. So note, we're opening this as a read-only file, but there's a bunch of writes in this diagram. So let's take a look at this diagram from, from the top. It says open bar here, but it, it means open foobar. Maybe it's a, the author's trying to make a terrible joke. I'm not really sure. The first thing that gets read is the root inode. So this leading slash on the, on the path foobar slash foo slash bar, that's a directory. And this is the root inode. The root inode is the where to start place in this path. And the root inode has a well-known location, a well-known inode number. Usually, usually, but not universally, the inode number for the root path is two. This is a well-known location, so we read this root inode, and we, after that, we read the data, the block, for the root inode itself. So remember, a, an inode for a directory has block pointers, the block pointers refer to blocks, and for a directory, the data that's in the block is entries in this file, in this directory. So we read the root inode, we read the root data block that is referred to by this inode. That tells us which inode number foo has, so the directory called foo. We look up the name in that table and we ask which inode number does this have. Once we know the inode number for foo, then we read the foo inode. We read the foo inode so that we can find out which data block it refers to, and then we read the data block for the foo inode. We read the data block for the foo inode so that we can look up the bar inode. We get the bar inode number based upon the name in the table, and then we read the bar inode. At that point, we have effectively opened this file. We've been able to take the bar inode number and map it directly to the foo inode. We've taken that bar inode number and now we're able to actually map it to the path that's been given to us and our file system driver will give us back a uh, file descriptor. So it will give us a number, some opaque number that is explicitly not the same as that inode number. At that point, now we can start actually reading this file. So we're going to read the bar inode. We're gonna do the read system call and we're going to read the bar inode again so that we can figure out where the data blocks are for this inode. We read the first bytes. So that means that we're going to read the first block for this inode. That's data bar, bar data at index zero. And then we do a write. We write to this bar inode because we're actually updating some of that metadata in the inode itself. There's another read system call for the next block. So we read the inode again to find out where the second block is. We do some arithmetic to figure out where that block is and we read that actual block and then we update the inode itself. And then the next one, finally, we read the last block that we want to read from this file. We read the inode, we read the block for the file and then we actually write to update the inode itself. That's reading a file from disk. Now let's think about writing a file to disk. It, it did not make any sense for there to be writes to the file, but in that we have things like access time on a file, that means that we have to make writes to the, to the inode itself to keep track of those properties. In figure 40.4 now, we're going through the process of creating a file and then writing some data to it. So in the first kind of section here at the top, we're doing the create system call. The create system call is going to do create and then we're passing to it this path slash foo slash bar. The very first thing that happens, similar to what was happening with read, we read that root inode. So we've got that well-known location. We read the root inode 
And then we read the data block that corresponds to the root inode. So we follow the data block pointer, we read the root inode to find the foo inodes, uh, inode number based on the name. Then we read the foo inodes, and then we read the foo data block. And the reason we're reading the foo data block is to try and figure out if there is an entry in there called bar or not. Once we figure that out, then we can start reading the inode bitmap to try and find out where there is a free inode that we can use to put this new file that we're creating. Once we find out which inode we can use, before we fill up that inode and try to write it, we're going to immediately update the bitmap. So we're gonna write the bitmap there. Then we're going to write to the foo data. We're going to update the directory to say this inode number has this name. We're gonna put the inode number that we just got for bar, and we're gonna put the name bar in that sequence of directories that we have in the foo data block. Then we're going to read the bar inode, write the bar inode, and then write the foo inode. This is going to update that metadata in the inodes about things like access time and modify time. After we've gone through the process of creating the file, at that point we're going to start writing to the file itself. So we do the same sort of process, except now we're going to be reading and writing the data bitmap. So first, we read the bar inode. We've got this inode number from the create system call, and now we can actually just directly read that inode. We can read the bitmap for the data, and then we can update the bitmap for the data. We're doing a write, we're gonna occupy these blocks. So mark those blocks as occupied in the data bitmap. At that point then, we can write to the data block in that we've picked, so bar data zero here, and we can write to the bar inode to refer to that block number. This is the first block for this file in the file system. The following sequence of writes do exactly the same thing, except they write to the next blocks. What we've done now is we've got our disk logically separated into different regions. We've got the data structures that are going to map onto that disk and we can follow paths through those data structures to actually get data. We've now seen also how those data structures are mapped onto file system calls. We've seen the other half of this file system implementation. Section 40.7 talks about caching and buffering. I'm gonna mark this as optional. You don't have to read this. And partly, the part of the reason for this is that it's, you, it's referring to this idea of virtual memory, which we're going to get to after we've talked about file systems. One thing that you can note about this section though, by me telling you verbally, is that there is a little bit of information here about write buffering. And the idea here is similar to what, you had, what we saw in the last chapter with this idea of the network card overloading the system. It gets into this um, live lock state trying to deal with interrupts. Write buffering is something similar. Instead of writing every single write request directly to the disk, we'll just hold on to a few of them and then write that as one big batch. To summarize this, while we haven't actually seen any code for this yet, we've, we've pretty much got a functional file system description. In, in theory, with this description, we should be able to build this file system to actually write software to read a volume that has a file system like this on it. We should be able to do that at this point. One final note I wanna make is that on page nine of this chapter, there's a pretty high level overview of a file system called FAT. This is the file system that's used by earlier than what we have now Windows operating systems, but is still extensively used on things like digital cameras or other devices that have smaller needs. It's, a, it's what I would consider to be a universal file system. We're going to take a look, a closer look at FAT. It's pretty different in terms of how things are structured than VSFS and EXT2, but we'll take a look at that in class. And ultimately, this is going to be an assignment that you're going to be working on, is implementing something that's going to read a FAT file system. So that's it for file systems. Thanks for listening, and I'll, I'll see you all soon.